So what in terms of hormones do we work on? So this is a, a third generation hormone treatment, Tibolone. It's um, been on the market for a while. And um, we did a, a study that's, I'll quickly get to the results, of um, adding Tibolone to existing treatment for perimenopausal women in a 12 week double blind con, um, placebo controlled study. And the results um, of this um, in 43 women showed that in fact uh, there was a significant decrease using the MADRAS, the depression rating scale on the y-axis, uh, that there was a significant decrease in time uh, across 12 weeks in the women who actually used the Tibolone. Uh, so you can see the two curves separating quite nicely by week 12. The green curve are the women who received a placebo. The blue is the women who received the Tibolone. So Tibolone is a useful adjunct, and this is the pu uh, our publication. Um, in terms of uh, actual treatment, that it is a form of uh, oral HRT. It has a little bit of estrogen, a little bit of progesterone, a little bit of androgen, and um, it is uh, easy to take because it's a tablet. And um, again, what I'm suggesting is not that this is the be all and end all, but it is an important strategy in terms of hormone treatment for perimenopausal depression. Of course, we also use the second line treatments of standard HRT, which includes estradiol plus prometrium as a, the oral progesterone because it's a nice one in terms of brain. We have to watch the progesterones. Too many of the HRTs, just like the pill, have a depressogenic progesterone. So I'd urge you to think about the hormonal milieu for the patient. Of course, this goes side by side with psychotherapy, um, with looking at social situations. And overall, um, women's mental health has not become a national priority, and I think it really should be. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, uh, Joshua, and really important advocacy. Go for it. Question starting at the top here. Yep. I do recommend psychiatrists prescribe the OCP, uh, particularly when we think about our adolescent psychiatrists, you know, working in headspaces and so on. It really is important that we ask the patient about her f um, family planning questions. You know, we, we tend to avoid them, but they're really high on the list for women um, of all ages. And we know that um, adolescents have unprotected sex, so we can't shy away from that. If you're going to prescribe the OCP, then you prescribe it and ask the GP to do the follow-ups with uh, blood pressure taking and so on. Um, the pap smears, of course, differ depending on whether she's had um, the HPV vaccinations and so on. But I, I think it is useful because your patient may not go to a GP, she may only go to you. Does Zoli cause more weight gain? It varies. There's, there's a very variable picture. It's not like the promoted Yaz and Yasmin which say it's, it's weight neutral, but um, some women do gain weight, others don't. Yes, there is a correlation between PMDD, perinatal and perimenopausal. In fact, one of the things that we look back when we've got someone we think has perimenopausal is we ask, did you have PMDD? Did you have uh, perinatal dis um, depression? And the answer is very much yes. We think it is related to the early life stressor and that is a bit higher in this, this, this group. Myrena, again, both in the Danish study and our study is bad for mood. Um, again, you know, I'm talking about the woman who's vulnerable, not everybody, but in the woman who's vulnerable for what that vulnerability is, which could just be a straight biological vulnerability, Myrena does have a problem with mood. So if your patient talks about changes in mood and the Myrena has been you know, inserted, she'll tell you that she's noticed some months since the Myrena insertion that her mood is not good. Believe her. 16 times, yes, it is possible. Um, it's the, go, the, the Harvard Mood studies show that. Some other studies show at least, at minimum, a fourfold increase. So the perimenopausal in uh, hormone sensitive breast cancers is a problem. We are very careful about anyone having uh, breast cancer. Of course, themselves, they, they are out of hormone treatment. But if she has a very strong family history with um, mother and aunt, then we also get her to have a BRCA test before we proceed. We do a lot of breast screening. In my younger women, um, even in the pill, 
uh, I uh, would suggest that we, from 20-something onwards, get breast ultrasound, not mammograms, but ultrasound, because we do know that women are not great at picking up whether a lump or bump is abnormal or normal. So um, that's important. Transdermal is through the cycle. It's providing a stable, uh, continual um, oestrogen upregulation. Why does the pill affect the mood? We think particularly through the progestin creating the allopregnanolone metabolite, which has an impact on serotonergic systems particularly, but also dopaminergic systems. We also think there's some GABA involvement and um, it's particularly the progesterone metabolite that's doing that. If someone is emotional, is OCP a cause? I would say yes, 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 please ask about it. There are obviously other things that might be happening, but the common description from the patient is, I can't see what else is happening. You know, it's, it, it, I've got the same job, the same boyfriend, things are okay, but I just feel crap. I can't enjoy things. I have a muted enjoyment of life. If Zoli is helpful, but has to be stopped after three months, when, no, no, as in, you take continuous Zoli and for three months and then have the sugar pills to have a period, then restart the three months again. So it's, a, it's taking the pill continuously, but at three months, um, then have the sugar pills. So it's three months continuous without the sugar pills. SNRI, this is a real myth. Um, so what happened was with the WHI study, the Women's Health, Health Initiative study in 2000, 2001, which has been debunked, a lot of that, which said that um, estrogen and progesterone causes breast cancer, etc. cetera, um, everyone threw away their HRT and then you had women with hot flushes. So somebody decided it was a great idea to use low dose venlafaxine to treat the hot flushes. The difficulty there was then the tachyphylaxis, so people's then doses would go up, but then you've got withdrawal and agitation symptoms. Sorry, withdrawal if you try and take it away, and agitation symptoms on it. So that's the issue. But of course, if you need to use an SNRI as part of the depression guidelines for treating depression, then you need to use it. Joshua, the original development of desvanlafaxine yeah, was, was to as a that. medicine for perimen perimenopausal dysphoria. Uh, and it was actually usefully studied up to 400 milligrams a day, which tucks us on that tachyphylaxis issue that Jay has mentioned. But it seems to me quite controversial that if we know that there's a hormonal problem that creates perimenopausal depression, all other things being equal, uh, why aren't we tackling the, the cause Underline. of the problem? Mm. Weight gain postmenopausally. Both Michael Burke and I were just at the uh, Australian New Zealand Obesity Society conference. We learnt a lot about obesity and weight gain. The average weight gain postmenopausally is between two and eight kilograms because there is a change in um, leptin, neuropeptide Y, which is estrogen uh, dependent. So there is a weight gain. Uh, but we found that um, metformin is a kickstart there, particularly in our South Asian population, women who are more at risk of diabetes, etc. So metformin is a kickstart. It doesn't give much of a weight loss, but it does give you about two kilo kilograms of weight loss, but it does have an appetite suppressant issue. There are many, many changes. It was very interesting from that Congress, but all of our stuff about um, it's all diet and exercise is pretty much thrown out the window. The, the latest think, thinking is that this is an endocrine problem and that there are changes in the CNS, particularly with the HPA axis, cortisol, et cetera, that is a big player in the actual obesity. So again, with the menopause, there's a big endocrine factor that is actually creating the weight gain. So we need to think about that from in terms of what are we going to do biochemically or biologically to enable this woman to maintain a healthy weight. Of course, some weight gain is inevitable and we need to, of course, make sure she's not doing something ridiculous with diet, um, et cetera. Um, no, HRT and Tibolone, uh, you know, they're standard um, medications that are on the on the PBS. Well, don't know if Tibolone's on the PBS, but anyway, so they're on standard medications. But of course, you have to be confident with the medical management of um, Pap smears, breast screening, uh, blood pressures, and so on. Again, working hand in hand with the GP is a good idea if that's not your bag. Cognitive issues are very important. I have a colleague, um, Dr. Caroline Gervich, who's researching the cognitive issues in menopause. And again, there are a number of strategies that help. Estrogen replacement is a good strategy for one thing, but if you're not going to go that way, then there are all sorts of cognitive upskilling um, programs that are available on your apps. Um, some of the uh, 
the brain training games, etc., are useful. But the other side of it is, as the hormone fluctuations that are really pronounced during perimenopause settle down, the cognition also improves. But that could take, menopause is a 10 year process, so it could take a while before getting to that. Sleep apnea rates, yes, increase in postmenopausal women because of the testosterone um, change in the testosterone estradiol, plus also if there's weight gain. So that's another issue to be watchful for. Given the risk of cognitive and psychological symptoms, uh, fitness of the group to hold public office. Okay, so um, we have to also consider that I'm talking about women a group of women who are very, very affected by this. This is not every woman, but don't forget that cognition changes over age. And some of the things that happen, uh, while there might be issues with particular memory disturbances, there are other growth areas in terms of dendritic growth in a global picture. So you look at the cognitive test factories and some of the executive functioning improves over age, which means that you've got wisdom um, but not perhaps the memory that you had. So um, I reckon we need many, many more women in public office of all types. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jessica. Very, very much.